Um, now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to the esteemed Dr. Gillian Spencer, child and adolescent psychiatrist, who's going to um, do the basics, the 101. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm a Monash girl, so I feel quite a strong connection to um, Melbourne and Victoria. Um, <clears throat> I'm here today because I see it as one of my responsibilities as a child and adolescent psychiatrist to do what I can to ensure that mental health treatments for children are safe and evidence-based. And I feel I must speak out when they're not. It's important to note today that we're talking about children who are physically normal. They don't have any chromosomal abnormalities or disorders of sexual development. We're talking about children with gender dysphoria, which is where a child or adolescent has a stated desire to be the opposite sex and classically a preference for stereotypically opposite sex clothing, playmates and play activities and a dislike of their own sexual anatomy. So I'll just start by explaining a little bit about the affirmation model so that we know what we're all talking about. The affirmation model is a controversial treatment approach for children with gender dysphoria, which is currently in place Australia-wide. The affirmation model as it's currently practiced is to encourage all children to contemplate their gender. And then when a child develops or presents with gender dysphoria, they are considered to be naturally trans or gender diverse, and they are encouraged to socially transition which in, involves adopting opposite sex pronouns, appearance, and name. And the family are firmly encouraged to support the social transition on the grounds that it's a life-saving approach to prevent suicide, despite there being no evidence that this is true. The first medical step in the affirmation pathway is puberty blockers, which are prescribed at the very start of puberty. It's Tanner's stage two, uh, which is roughly age 10 to 12. Puberty blockers were originally conceptualised as giving children time to think, but what we know from their widespread use is that they prevent the child from recovering from gender dysphoria. In the 11 studies where the affirmation model was not used, so children were not given puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones, 60 to 90% of children recovered from gender dysphoria through the course of adolescence. However, once on puberty blockers, <clears throat> Sorry, instead of recovering, about 95% of children will go on to take cross-sex hormones. Puberty blockers have side effects similar to menopause, like fatigue, hot flushes, weight gain and mood problems. They also reduce bone mineralisation at a time of life when bones should be peaking in their bone density. There are suspected effects on cognitive and emotional development because adolescence is an important time for brain development. Last year, the FDA put a warning label on puberty blockers for a condition that causes raised intracranial pressure. The research studies indicate that treatment with puberty blockers does not lead to improvements in mood or psychosocial functioning or in the symptoms of gender dysphoria. There is no evidence that they reduce the risk of suicide. If puberty blockers are started in Tanner stage two as recommended, the child will be infertile and their sexual functioning will likely be impaired. There's a specific risk to boys from the puberty blockers because there isn't enough tissue for the vaginoplasty. So they require the use of some tissue from another site, which is a much more dangerous surgical procedure. Cross-sex hormones are prescribed to children when the child is able to consent. This now occurs in gender clinics from as early as the age of 14. In Australia, girls with gender dysphoria are having double mastectomies from the age of 15. Other gender surgeries tend to be taken, um, undertaken close to age 18. The threshold for a child being able to consent, um, to, be, to be able to, to be considered to have the capacity to consent to these gender treatments of hormones and surgeries was considerably lowered in 2016 by a family court decision Re Darrell. Prior to this case, to be considered able to consent, a child was required to fully understand what was proposed. In this family court case, a child and adolescent psychiatrist gave expert evidence to the court. I actually think she was a Queensland female child psychiatrist, so I'm proud of her. 
So she gave expert evidence to the court that no adolescent would be able to fully understand the lifelong implications of infertility, impaired sexual function, and the irreversible changes to the body, as well as the physical health side effects, consequences, and risks. However, unfortunately, instead of preserving an important principle that a child needs to fully understand the long-term consequences and risks of a treatment to be able to consent, the court buckled under the pressure from the gender clinic doctors who falsely claimed that these gender treatments were urgently needed to prevent suicide. So the threshold for consent was changed. Since 2016, an adolescent no longer needs to fully understand in order to consent. They only have to have the ability to consider different options and their consequences. In Australia over the last seven to eight years, we've had a massive increase in the number of children presenting with gender dysphoria. Historically, gender dysphoria affected a tiny proportion of children and they were predominantly prepubescent boys. These days, it's mainly adolescents, mainly adolescent females, and the adolescents presenting have high levels of comorbid, mental, mental illness, neurodiversity, histories of trauma, and they often have friends who are transitioning. Despite claiming ongoing high levels of discrimination and abuse towards trans people, the gender activists will tell you that this incredible increase in adolescents presenting to gender clinics is all due to a reduction in the stigma of being transgender. This is a completely implausible claim. If it was, if it was simply the impact of a reduction in stigma, this would result in a similar proportion of people across the lifespan identifying as trans, but this is not the case. The dramatic increase in people identifying as trans is disproportionately occurring amongst adolescent girls. The change in the sex of children presenting from historically always prepubescent boys to now predominantly adolescent girls also cannot be explained by a reduction in stigma. In addition, as May mentioned, there are countries such as Sweden <clears throat> sorry, where culturally acceptance of gender transition has been high for a really long time. Sweden was the first country in the world to legalise gender transition in 1972. However, regardless of the lack of stigma in Sweden, they still saw a 1,500% increase in, the, in gender dysphoria amongst females aged 13 to 17 between 2008 and 2018. Due to this, in 2022, Sweden decided to by and large restrict hormonal and surgical treatments to adults. Historically, it has always been adolescent girls who have been the most susceptible to enacting social trends, particularly those related to distress turned inward. You sometimes hear the gender activists claiming that the recent massive increase in people identifying as trans is similar to the increase in people being left-handed between 1900 and 1960 during a period where there was a reduction in the stigma of being left-handed. Gender activists won't admit that there has not simply been a reduction in stigma occurring around the concept of being transgender. There has been a strong social movement focused on enthusiastically celebrating and promoting trans people. This has been occurring online, through community events, in books, on our televisions and in schools. In our community, it is children and adolescents who are most sensitive to social cues and messages. When children and adolescents identify as trans, they are stepping into a role where they are perceived as brave, emotionally complex and misunderstood, and they feel they are part of an important social justice movement. This can understandably be an intoxicating persona for some adolescents. It can also be an escape from distress or a solution to social difficulties. In making an erroneous comparison to left-handedness, the gender activists are being quite cruel in not acknowledging the deep concern of many parents of children with gender dysphoria who are going through a situation that is the equivalent of having always seen their child eating with a spoon in their right hand, completing their homework with their right hand, and playing racket sports with their right hand, suddenly in adolescence claiming to be left-handed, and health professionals treating parents with contempt if they don't affirm their child's hands pre hand preference. The affirmation model undermines the parent-child relationship and the entire structure of the family by putting the parents in a weak and frightened position. This is because the gender clinic 
clinicians provide false information to parents that without gender affirming care, their child will, be likely, will likely die by suicide. Also, parents fear losing their child because their child is being told online that if their parents don't affirm them, then they're hate-filled bigots and should be cut off. This undermining of parents often deprives children of the strong and confident parenting that they need in order to recover from their feelings of distress. I have heard your previous Victorian Premier say in Parliament that no child would choose to be trans because it is a very hard path in life. This statement demonstrates a profound lack of knowledge about the complexity of various children's lives. For example, it reflects a failure to empathically understand that girls with a history of sexual abuse or trauma might see, a way, might see transitioning as a way to be never hurt again. It fails to understand that children with autism spectrum disorders might go searching for a reason as to why they've always felt different and marginalised and that identifying as a trans person opens up opportunities for connection, which is a relief from the social isolation. Children with autism spectrum disorders also often react negatively to change and they have sensory sensitivities. And so they can be anxious and uncomfortable with the bodily changes of puberty. They can see puberty blockers as a quick, quick way out of this distress. In supporting the use of the affirmation model, your previous Premier didn't seem to want to understand that some adolescents can be rejecting of their own feelings of same-sex attraction and that blocking puberty can be an escape from these desires. He didn't seem to want to dwell on the reasons why amongst the children referred to the Tavistock's Gender Identity Development Service in the UK, the proportion who were in out-of-home care or adopted was eight times higher than in their general population. Feelings of gender dysphoria can not only link to experiences of trauma, but can link to a child's feelings of uncertainty about where they belong in the world. Children and adolescents are at risk of trying to reinvent themselves as a strategy to escape past or current pain. It is not compassionate to ignore the complexity of this issue. It is not compassionate to ignore the complexity of the emotional world of children and adolescents and the complexities of their life experiences and the impact upon them of complexities in their family relationships. Public figures that promote a closed-minded approach towards any psychological or social factors contributing to a young person's gender dysphoria are making it much harder for mental health clinicians to do the important work of engaging psychotherapeutically to help these young children recover. The gender advocates ignore the significant body of neuroscience research on adolescents. It is well established from MRI studies and cognitive research that the brains of adolescents are in a phase of rapid remodeling. The prefrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain responsible for abstract thinking, planning, impulse control, perspective taking and complex decision making, develops last, and it is not completely developed until people are in their mid-twenties. This means that adolescents compared to adults find it more difficult to manage their emotions and to think through consequences. Even if the adolescent intellectually knows the risks and consequences, they may prioritise short-term rewards, such as connection to and acceptance by a peer group, or the short-term relief from distressing feelings and emotion and sensations the neuroscience research makes it clear that children and adolescents do not have the developmental and neurological capacity to consent to these long-term, life-changing and potentially damaging gender interventions. Adolescents can embark on a journey of transition and continue along the path, hoping that they will finally feel better after they've gone through the next stage and the next stage. It takes people a long time to let go of something that they've come to believe will be the solution to all their difficulties. The diagnosis of gender dysphoria is based on a child's answers to questions, which can be influenced by a whole range of factors. We don't have a blood test or a scan to confirm the diagnosis. This makes it very dicey to be implementing such very serious long-term interventions on this basis. It is important to know that gender clinics are not set up to provide mental health services. 
their approach to assessing children and families is radically different to that of a child and adolescent mental health service. Because the gender advocates believe that the children presenting to gender clinics are naturally trans, the gender clinics are set up as medical clinics. Yet we know that the children presenting to gender clinics have incredibly complex mental health problems and they are in desperate need of a proper mental health service. The gender clinics function as rapid assessment and treatment services and the only treatment they provide is the affirmation model. I just want to explain how a general child and adolescent service functions. So in a general child and adolescent service, a, clini a clinician will conduct an assessment over several sessions to understand the range of difficulties that the child is experiencing. The clinician will obtain information from the child and the family and also from the school and any other relevant stakeholders to explore all the possible biological, family, developmental and psychological factors affecting the child's symptoms. They will then develop an initial hypothesis about why the child is struggling and the clinician will then rely on the multidisciplinary team to help them further explore their hypothesis. For example, they might decide to involve the team psychologist to do a cognitive assessment or involve the team social worker to help them further assess the family dynamics. They will discuss the case with the team psychiatrist who may see the child to consider whether the child has a developmental disorder or a mental illness. And the clinician's understanding of the factors contributing to the child's presenting problems evolves over time with inputs from the team. As the clinician's understanding of all the contributing factors emerges, this guides the various interventions provided. However, with the gender clinics, a, a child presenting to with gender dysphoria is considered to be naturally trans or gender diverse. And what I have seen is that regardless of the complexity of the child's background and presentation, the gender clinic always comes to the same conclusion. They conclude that the child's gender dysphoria is persistent, insistent and consistent and should be treated using the affirmation model. Any other mental health or social problems the child is experiencing is attributed to the stigma of being transgender and these problems are expected to resolve through treatment with social transition, puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones and gender surgeries. The concept of having a multidisciplinary team in a gender clinic is meaningless when everyone in the team is contractually obliged to follow the affirmation model, which is written into the gender clinic's model of care. The gender clinics don't provide ongoing therapy. They may refer a child to an affirming psychologist in private practice for ongoing counselling. However, the Tavistock clinicians identified that once a child is on puberty blockers, it is very hard to get the child to engage in psychological therapy to work on their gender dysphoria. The affirmation model is radically different from any other treatment approach in child psychiatry. Child psychiatry has always regarded the years of childhood and adolescence as a time of incredible growth and change. We have never regarded a child's feelings or behaviours as fixed. We've always known that emotional and behavioural difficulties in childhood and adolescence ease with maturity. It is incredibly distressing for many of us working in child and adolescent mental health services to see how these gender clinics are operating. One, la one day last year, the team I was working in the hospital received an education session from a nurse at the gender clinic. And the topic of the education session was chest binding. The gender clinic nurse was, um, said that she was running education sessions on chest binding for all the school-based youth health nurses, which exist in all the public schools in Queensland. And I also found out that the hospital was running chest binder fitting sessions for adolescent girls. And the nurse um, said that these sessions were the, um, the favorite part of her job. And I knew at that stage that the binders um, destroy um, breast architecture. And so the breasts end up um, flat like a grandma's. And this reinforces a pathway towards double mastectomy. And um, I was very distressed because she explained that binders are expensive. So after the young person has their top surgery, they will donate their binder to a local NGO to be provided to another adolescent girl to use. And when I heard this, I felt concerned that my health service had lost its way. Sorry. 
and we're actively colluding with the disgust that some adolescent girls feel towards their bodies. Sorry. Um, gender activists constantly use the risk of suicide to justify implementing these impl inter interventions. However, there is no reliable evidence that gender dysphoria is associated with a higher suicide risk than other mental health problems in children. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, there's no reliable evidence that puberty blockers or cross-sex hormones reduce suicide risk. There's no reliable evidence that these interventions improve psychosocial outcomes. In my opinion, the most helpful first step that the government can take for all children and their families is to disallow the prescription of puberty blockers for gender dysphoria. We know that puberty blockers aren't safe because they don't allow the child their best chance at recovery from gender dysphoria, which is to go through puberty. Their best chance of recovery is to experience the full course of adolescence, which includes a broadening of the social group, a broadening of interests and activities, at the sexual awakening and the experiences of intimacy. It is not safe to have the option of puberty blockers available, even in limited circumstances, because children will imagine them to be a quick fix to their distress and they will escalate in their emotions and behaviours to try and obtain them. And that creates a situation which is more risky. We are very lucky in child and adolescent psychiatry because the suicide rate amongst children and adolescents is thankfully very low. We do see a lot of children who report suicidal ideation with sincerity. For example, it, it wouldn't be uncommon for a child with um, anorexia to say that they will attempt suicide if made to, made to gain weight. Or kids with school refusal say that they will kill themselves if made to go to school. Our approach in these cases is always to watch them and support them and continue to do what is necessary to help them recover from their illness. Sadly, no, no child psychiatrist or psychiatrist has a crystal ball. When it comes to children with gender dysphoria, we have no way to identify which children will persist in their gender dysphoria nor can we predict which of these children as adults will say that they are happy to have traded in their fertility, sexual function and physical health to be more likely to pass as the opposite sex. Doing more comprehensive and prolonged assessments will not get us any closer to knowing which children will persist in their gender dysphoria. The safest approach is to take a different approach. The, aff the affirmation model needs to go. What is often missing from in discussions about gender treatments for children are the voices of adults who experienced gender dysphoria in childhood but grew out of it. They value their fertility and their capacity for sexual pleasure and their good physical health. These are the lucky people from previous generations when the affirmation model was not in use. The voices of young adults who transitioned in childhood are starting to be heard in the privacy of GP and psychiatrist rooms across the country. We are starting to witness what it means for people to live with the devastating consequences of these interventions. This is often a group of lost young people with chronic fatigue and other medically unexplained health problems who are not able to function in the workforce and struggle to maintain relationships. They remain unhappy with their bodies, socially awkward, lonely and desperately unhappy. Their social world is often restricted to the queer community as they've lost other connections. They fear losing these connections if they were to acknowledge feelings of regret or attempt to detransition. De they remain trapped in the affirmation model. I'll just finish by saying that last month it was three years since the harms of the affirmation model came into full public view with exposure of the Tavistock Clinic scandal and the UK government announced that they were commissioning the CAS review. This month, it is three years since the UK released their systematic reviews of, published, of the published research and concluded that there is no reliable evidence of benefit from puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones. This three-year delay in taking action to prevent Australian children being harmed is part of this scandal. We urgently need an independent inquiry into the gender treatments being delivered to children across Australia. Thank you. Thank you.